Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the round table here at Calvary Assembly of God, where we are studying the book of Revelation. And we uh, know that this is a larger title, The Revelation of Whom? Jesus. The Revelation of Whom? Jesus. Jesus, the Christ, the Anointed One, born of a virgin, the Savior of our soul, and he wants to reveal himself to the church. Uh, he, w he would like to reveal himself to the world. Uh, John says that he came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them they get to become sons and daughters of God. What a, what a tremendous invitation, and the revelation of who he is just gets larger and larger and larger. Pastor Matt, greet us tonight. Have you ever... Um... Have you ever went to school that uh, the first thing they do is give you a syllabus mm -hmm. and you, you, you can tell what you're supposed to do the entire year. You know when the tests are due, you know when the papers are due, you know what's due. I mean, everything. You, you see the entire schedule and it's like, holy moly. It's a bunch. Like, I don't know, how, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And it's, it's overwhelming. Um, that would be like if Jesus came to you and says, here I am. It's like, whoa, you, you won't be able to handle it. Right. Even the stuff that we're looking at right now, it seems overwhelming. And he just presented himself, and it was like you could barely see it because it was so much bright. It was so, so light. You, you couldn't grab a hold of everything that was happening. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so he's displaying just one thing after another. Can you, can you guys get this? Can, can, you, can you see this? And he's not like trying to keep things from us. You, you and I can't handle it's overwhelming if he just, here I am. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So he's, he's opening himself to you just slowly, not because you don't deserve to see the whole thing, but slowly. Uh, he does that in our spiritual life, doesn't he? Yes. You know, we, you get saved and you think, all right, I hit it. I'm, I'm the best I can ever be right now. He says, oh, that's cute. <laughs> what about that spot? And you didn't even realize that was a problem. And it opens the Pandora box, and then you take care of that. He says, man, you did a great job. Now let's look at this point of view of your life. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's what he does to us on a regular basis. That's what he does in Scripture. That's what he does in our hearts. He, he, he does things slowly. If he presented who you were going to be in 10 years, you couldn't handle it. Let's just focus in on this week, this project, this essay. And let's do it well, and then it'll get us ready for the next one. Are we alive? Yes. Making sense? All right, before we go forward into the Church of Philadelphia, we have to go backwards to the Church of Sardis. We didn't feel like we did a, a good, complete job because there was a, a very strong theological question that was asked at the end. Uh, Dean, I believe you brought up <clears throat> John 3.16, right? <clears throat> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal or everlasting life, right? A beautiful promise. It is the scripture by which the gospel hinges upon. Without this knowledge of what Jesus brings to us, we don't understand salvation. So the promise is if we believe, we're going to have eternal life. What spun the question that comes from that text on his head is one that was written in Revelation chapter 3 as it relates to this book that Jesus has. And he's talking in this scripture, verse 5, Revelation 3, verse 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Um, when you read that from an understanding of, all right, I'm not going to blot people's names out, which the reverse of that must be true, that if people don't respond in repentance, it seems like Jesus is willing to blot their name out of a book. And then Dean said, but what about the promise of 
of John 3.16. And now we have what seems to be a conflict in Scripture. So what do we do with this seeming conflict as Jesus is revealing his nature that the gospel message is, is drummed up in this fullness that he loves the world, he is willing to give himself for payment of your sin, and whoever believes in that will receive eternal life. What do we do when there's a scripture that seems to say, yeah, but I'm not going to give you eternal life? What do we do with that conflict? And I believe we need to look at terms. And and we're going to do that together. And I hope that we have some clarity as a group that we can move forward on. All right. Yeah. So let's look at the let's look at the church of Sardis again and see what the problem was. I think that will help bring a little clarity. Verse two, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works to be perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. So here's a group group of people that appeared to start the race. They got their shoes. They got their racing outfit on. They believed that Jesus died for their sin. What happened to them after they started the race? What can you glean as Jesus is saying, yeah, you you look good, but you're not going so well, right? What what happens to these individuals? One thing, Pastor, that uh, verse 5 you read a while ago, starting out, he that overcometh, it does not say he that overcometh and then backslides through personal choice, but through personal choice stays overcome. Right. Second Peter 2.21, I think that's a good, that is a really... And verse 22. And verse 22, yeah. I mean, it, that says it right there. Can you read them? Yeah. It, nice and loud. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. So they, there it is. They turned their back. They got busy with something else. Right. And so... So I think what we're seeing in the revelation of Jesus is he's not ready to cast you into hell. His love says, I want to approach you first and tell you where you're wrong. That's true love, right? Love brings discipline into your life. True love disciplines you and true love responds to that discipline is what we're seeing. So the love of Christ is, is saying, look, I know you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're actually dead. You, you've become deadened to my spirit. If you don't repent of this, I'm going to take what remains away, and you're not going to be anything to me. But if you repent and overcome, you're right back on track. Mm-hmm. Are we making sense? Yeah. So, Pastor Matt, any, any comments so far? Yeah, because it actually says, I don't remember if I read that in Philadelphia or not, where it says you, the little strength you have. Mm-hmm. Because you get to the point, remember the, in James one uh, fifteen, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, sin with full grown, gives birth to death. Um, understand the audience here are believers. You know, the, the Bible is written to believers. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like written to unbelievers. So when we, when we, have that desire we have sin we become weaker and so it makes sense anyways in my mind where it says the, the weaker i get i don't i don't know if that makes sense to you do you do you ever screw up and, and start having sin you just feel spiritually you know weak mm-hmm. is it that that makes sense to you right it makes sense to me i know i i, I feel weak i know if i miss devotions if i if mm-hmm. i don't spend time in the word i feel spiritually weaker and I'll try to compensate that throughout the day by listening to sermons, by, by listening to more Christian music, to get something in me because I know I didn't start my day out the way I should have. Right. And I feel weaker. And so he tells the church, the little strength you do have, keep going, man. Mm-hmm. You still got strength. I don't care if you fell, 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 fell. This is not being you sin, you go to hell. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what we preach. That's, that's false doctrine. If we become weak, relax. 
We're all here to pick each other back up. Let's keep on moving. I know you're weak. Let's become strong. So I know this might sound weird to you, but I was pastoring this church in Pennsylvania, and I got a phone call from this guy, and he says, um, I just changed my will. Your church is now going to inherit my estate. Okay. How much are you worth, sir? No. <laughs> 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 I said, what happened? Do you, do you not have anyone to give it to? He's like, oh yeah, I have kids, and I've had about enough of them. <laughs> so I've cleared their names, and now what belonged to them belongs to you. Thank you, sir. He's like, when I pass away, my lawyers will contact you. You don't have to do anything. Blah, blah, blah. All right. It all happened. It all transpired. I was waiting for his children to come and somehow beat me up. or They never showed. They never questioned anything. His estate came to that church. And it was actually a, a tremendous blessing to that church. It was a tremendous blessing. But what does that have to do with this? Those children were his. He poured into him. They, he poured into them. He loved them. But there was a point where he kept saying, if you berate me, if you keep doing this, I'm going to take away what I had planned for you all along. My inheritance belongs to you. I want it to be yours. But if you keep pushing me in this direction, I will, will take it from you and give it to another. And that's exactly what he did. And that seems to be what Christ does. That he invites you, Dean, I believe he invites everybody into the relationship and says, I want you to have this inheritance. This is the way to the inheritance. I am the way, the truth, and the what? Life. life. It's trifold, right? The way, the truth, and the life. If you miss any one of those, you're off, off track and you're not going towards the destination. And that's kind of what John 3.16, when you come to the word believe, which was what Christy was trying to say, the word believe in that passage is trust in, cling to, rely on Jesus for everything. If you do not somehow believe like that, then you don't have the relationship with Christ that you think you have. And there are a lot of people Unfortunately, in today's America, we do crusades. People feel convicted of their sin. They respond to a message, raise their hand for salvation, and actually believe that Jesus is their Savior. But they never walk the way, the truth, and the life. They never walk it. And so Jesus says, hey, remember, you, you became part of my family. I want you to inherit you're going to have to change this, 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 and this. And if they keep going and don't repent, what is his only response? You're not going to inherit eternal life. You're inheriting the fruit of what you've, you've put into. Um, Jesus, when, he's, when he, he uses the word wake up a couple of times in here. Yeah. And so, when we believe, we must maintain that belief. Uh -huh. You just don't believe it one time and forget about it. You know, Jesus says, wake up. Earlier in, in, in the Gospels, when Jesus said, talked about sleeping and waking up, he was talking about people that were dead. Right. Physically dead. But Jesus never said they were dead. He said, they're just asleep. So, they're, so, 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 so this belief has to be... Maintain. I think it's AA that says maintaining a conscious contact with God and, and his will for us to carry that out. So there has to be, that belief is the mechanism. That's our part in our salvation. Amen. And so what we cost, so to me what makes sense of, of, of this notion of being blot out is if belief is the mechanism that moves us into salvation, towards Jesus' salvation for us, then what can blot us out? That's our unbelief. And, and I'm not saying the doubt, because 
I have moments well, yeah, we all have doubts. of doubt, but when you choose not to believe, like children believe in Santa Claus, do we? No. We've, we've died to that. We've shut that off. We've quit maintaining that. What? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, 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 that's probably a poor example. That's probably a poor example. But it was but deep. I, I down to maintenance. We have to continue to believe. Now, when I look at, it, it, is it Romans? Romans 10 9 says not only the belief part is there, but there's a action on our part. We have to confess with yeah. our mouth right. and believe. And then we are saved. Right. Um, John 3.16 says we'll have everlasting life. And it's and I kind of was looking at this the other day. I've got a concordance where I can plug in and check out the Old Testament word. But the, the everlasting life and then when in Romans 10, they're two different things. Right. And, However, and, and here it's all about being saved and, and having salvation and being saved. But it comes down to being awake, conscious contact. Continuing, maintaining the belief. Right. And in the middle of all this, th this is a um, age-old argument, Arminianism and Calvinism, that we're not going to solve here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> You're just not. There are people that have been taught. I have been taught in both camps. Uh, I can look at it and step away and say I can see the credence and value to both. But there are people out there who are shooting up heroin tonight that don't know who Mr. Armini, Ar, Arminian is or who John Calvin was and don't give a rip. Uh, they need rescued, they need salvation and taught the way, the truth and the life and the journey. Eventually we, the church, do our job and rescue them, but Jesus leads them. And that's what he's saying here. I'm in the dance and I'm the lead. And if you don't follow my lead, you're not in the dance with me. I think that's what the value of this text is tonight. In, in the jail system, we, we kind of talk about relapse on a regular basis. Uh, most of the arrests that we have in the jail are violators. It's not like they did something new. It's just a violation of probation. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really unfortunate. They'll do the crime five years ago, the last week of probation, they celebrate a little early <laughs> and they get caught and they got to start this whole process all over again. It's really frustrating. It feels so bad for them. But a lot of the, a lot of the inmates we have in the jail are VOPs, it's a violation of probation. Yep. So we kind of talked about that. And the question I was trying to get to, it's, I, I take more of a counselor chaplain position as opposed to a pastoring position. Pastoring is so much easier. Um, I can just say, no, you're wrong because of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> chaplain, pass, or a counselor, you got to tell me how you feel about this. Uh, and you kind of kind of walk them through some stuff. So I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you see here? Um, so, so we're sitting there talking about relapse. And so I asked the question. All right, so who in here has ever relapsed? And, you know, most people raise their hand. I was like, all right, when did you officially relapse? Well, it was on this day, and I took heroin. I was like, no, time out. When did you officially relapse? Um, well, when I, when I got caught, no, that's not when you rela relapsed. When did you relapse? And then I had to get to the point where they're actually saying, when I chose to start thinking and go this way. Is, does that make sense? Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because, is, is it okay if I go to that one? Yeah. All right, so give me, give me a second here. Um, the reason why I say that is because I have a, um, you, you don't have to write this down. I actually have a, 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 a handout that you can take with you. Um, <coughs> so this is Assurance of Salvation. Okay, <laughs> just so you know, this is from the Assemblies of God website. Um, you'll see an ag.org. Okay, if you go to ag.org, you'll see this uh, You'll see this screen right here, beliefs. <laughs> you click on position papers, go down here, and that's assurance of salvation. And there's a bunch of there's a bunch of beliefs here. This is where we stand. This is why we believe this. Anywhere from eternal punishment, divorce and remarriage, uh, divine healing, anything and everything. And one of these is assurance of salvation. So it gives you these these principles. And the reason why I think this is important because I've read so many articles about this subject matter. And from the Calvinist standpoint, where you are once saved, always saved, the argument we agree with. 
There's no difference. The problem I have with all the arguments is their argument that they put words on the other side. And they argue that. The problem with this, that's not my stance. But you're arguing this stance. And I'm like, I'm against that too, just so we're on the same page. So let me show you. That here's the four main points of this whole article. Salvation is available for every person. Agreed? Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're Presbyterian, non-denominational. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, that's your foundation. Salvation is available for every person. There are verses for every single one of these. Don't worry about writing them down. I have the paper for you. <laughs> Salvation is received and assured through faith. Right? Not by our works. This is Arminianism is not a works-based religion. Okay? It's not a work-based faith. Okay? Uh, salvation is ongoing conflict with temptation and sin. Although we wrestle get, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual weakness in high places. My fight is not with Pastor Kevin. My fight is a spiritual fight. Yes. Does that make sense? Your mother-in-law is not the problem. <laughs> There's a constant battle. John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But I've come that you may have a life and have it abundantly or more abundantly. Okay? There's a constant struggle between the good you and the bad you, if I can go cartoons on this. Okay? Holy Spirit and the demon. Sin nature. The next point is where the Calvinist point of view about what I believe is where it's wrong. Okay, and this is where a lot of people are like, ooh, I don't, I don't know about this one. It's this point: the believer's salvation may be forfeited or abandoned by willfully turning away from Christ. Do you see it all where it says, if you sin, you go to hell? No. No. Do you understand? That's not what the AG says. That's not what the Bible says. We are 100% against that. So if your statement is I'm not going to go to that church anymore because they believe if I sin, I'm going to go to hell if I die afterwards. No, he didn't. That would be a lie. That's not biblical. That's not what it says. And there is reference after reference after reference of why that's not true. It's about forfeiting. It's about abandoning your faith. What Bob was saying, you abandon your faith. Understand, let's go back to rehab. When do you rehab? Or not rehab. When do you um, relapse? Thank you. When do you relapse? Here. That's where it begins. Sin is the fruit of your mind. Do you understand that? It's not about the act of a sin. You start it here, and that's the beginning. It's the fruit of it. That's the germination. And then what everybody else says that believes that they do believe in once they do always say, their argument is... But if I sin, I don't believe God's going to throw me in hell because I sin. We don't either. We don't either. <laughs> For like all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If that verse doesn't apply to you, let me touch the hem of your garment. <laughs> is this making sense? Yeah. Yeah, and this. The rest of that verse says, and the gift of God is eternal life. And I guess that is, I could see that word. It's a gift, and I guess God could take it back, but you could choose yeah and if i i'm not saying this is what it is remember i was saying earlier as far as jesus kind of introduces himself like if i show you who i really am and what this is all about you can't handle it john three sixteen is the beginning of his ministry for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son oh wow that's amazing that's awesome all right let's get more details in this and then when you read paul and you read all these other letters it's like there's 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 actions that have to take place afterwards. If your life looks identical to the way it looked 20 years ago when you got saved, I'm just letting you know you are very weak. Okay, that's what scripture says. If you go to work and you tell them you go to church and they're like, what? That's a red flag there. Where's the holiness? Where's the set apart? So these four things are the basis of not just, it, yes, it's from the, somebody's got a website, but it's verse after verse after verse that when, when, you, see the, when you see the fence of Calvinism and, and what they're saying, it's, we, we believe that. We believe what you're saying. The problem is you're, you're making it like a 
sin and no sin. No, 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 that's not. If you walk away from your faith, that's a bigger deal. You're gonna sin. Does that make sense? Remember what Psalm 119.11 says? I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The opposite is, is, tr is true. I don't have your word in my heart. I'm going to sin against you. It's, the sin isn't the issue. It's the heart. Like Gary, you could look at me and say, I believe I can fly. Yeah. I, I think you can, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> and you walk away, I'm like, what a loon. Yeah. <laughs> like, I could put my agreement with you and sure. walk away and say something different about you and live differently. I think that's the point you're making, right? Mm -hmm. That people could say, yes, Jesus is Lord. Well, James says even the demons know that. That's right. wow. yeah. that's right. that's right. They know he's Lord and they sure aren't on their way to heaven. That's right. For everybody in this room that's struggling with this right now, I am so happy for you. It's the best thing that could happen to you. Because a year ago for me, when this we were going to melt with, with Calvary Church, this whole thing kind of upset my mind a little bit. Sure. And so it caused me to hash this out with God That's good. and find the truth. Yeah, more of the word begins to solve these issues. It was the best thing to happen in my faith. Yep. I, I, I will say this one thing. If you are in the camp of even, even this conversation, it doesn't change your mind at all. You're still one saved, always saved. You know what that means? <laughs> You're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's okay. If, you, if, we can, if we convince you the other way, relax. We're like on the same team. Go back to home base. Yeah. Does that make sense? We're on the same team. Okay. Yep. This is an in-house argument. Yes. Right. Non-Christians don't even know to have this argument. Yeah. The, the people that are, the, the people that believe in Jesus Christ, and, you're, and everybody in here are, is in the same boat, you're, you're seeking God. Uh, Bob and I were having a conversation last week, and he was, he was going back and forth for the past year about this, and he was saying, I was really struggling. I was really struggling. Do I do this? Am I really saved? Am I, I, was like, I was like, Bob, time out. The fact that you're having this conversation with God you're okay. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're okay. Because if you really are turning away, <laughs> you like don't care. Yeah. Yep. Just don't does, that make, care. does that make sense? So whether, you, whether you're once saved, always saved, or you don't believe in that, it's whew, breathe. Yeah. You seek God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Once saved, always saved, it becomes relevant. Yeah. So I'm going to read a verse in 1 John. 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse... 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not leading to death. How many of you are thoroughly confused? Now, because <laughs> the Bible clearly says the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if I come into the family of God and I, and I sin, am I going to death? No. This passage tells me no. I'm in a relationship with God and I sin. It's not leading to your damnation and death. Does anybody feel relieved? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that you can come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and not be perfect. Right. 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 You're going to sin, you're going to make mistakes, That's but right. you're not out. Right. Right. However, if he approaches you about this sin and you're like, get out of here. Mm -hmm. I think you're on real thin ice. Because this is talking about a relationship. If Matt and I have a relationship and I see him or he sees me sinning, we have an obligation to say, hey, bro, yeah. what's up? What's going on here? Looks like you're off track. Not on your way to hell. Tripping your way there. <laughs> Remember, sin when full grown. Not sin is death. It's sin when full grown is death. So I had a question mark in my Bible for a long time because I kept going back to the wages of sin is death. How can there be a sin that doesn't lead to death? Oh, it's one in a relationship where I am walking with Christ, but I'm still under major attack. That is not preached very well from television evangelists. 
that this is your best life ever and all that sort of stuff. You come in with Christ, it is war on a spiritual front like you've never seen before. Yes, he tries to rob, steal, kill, destroy, all of that. There's a big target on your back, and if you're not going to fortify and not stand in the word and have people in your life that hold you accountable, it's going to be messed up. This assumes you're accountable to somebody. And if you're not, watch out. You're all alone out there just dangling for the enemy to just... And I don't think he fires darts unnecessarily. I think he waits until you're... What I, what I spell out at Jill's place, lonely, mm -hmm. under uh, stress, Exhausted. stressed out, yeah. tired, it was lust, yeah. Yeah. right? It was an acronym. When, when you're at your weakest, he's like, fire away. Fire away. Now we can get him. I don't think he's wasting arrows. I think he's been doing this for a long time. And he knows exactly how to attack. And he knows when to fish and when you're not biting. And so we've got to know how the enemy works. We are not ignorant of his devices, Peter says. We've got to know what his devices are and how he attacks. Why would we even talk about that if there's not the possibility of us going down? So we've got, the devil wouldn't waste his time if you were saved and he couldn't somehow entangle you all over again. He wouldn't even waste his time. But he does. He studies you and he waits for vulnerability and he attacks. We making sense here tonight? Now we gotta start all over, Ron. <laughs> I'll watch the YouTube. All right, good job. So when, when, when we talk about spiritual warfare, I, I, He's not wasting darts, I promise. He's not wasting arrows. What he does, he's actually aiming. You know what he's aiming for? He's aiming for your shield. Do you know why he's aiming for your shield? No, he, he, he wants you to make sure that even if it's just sitting right here and all this is exposed, he's going to aim for that little shield right there. And the reason why is because he doesn't want you to learn to do this. He wants you to learn. All I got to do is relax, mm -hmm. cruise, mm -hmm. sit right here, and I can block everyone. Because he keeps on aiming for the same spot because he knows you're not going to get better in your defense. Because if he starts aiming at other things to start hitting, you're going to be like, I'm going to start studying the Bible. Yeah. I just got hit pretty hard. And I got, you know, cancer, arrest, lost a loved one. I got fired. That those, are, those are darts that hit us, and we don't know what to do. So we're going to get in the Word, like, oh, my Lord, I need to start praying more. than No, what he does, he's going to start aiming for that same spot over and over and over because you're really good at it because you're sitting there doing nothing, not challenging yourself, not growing, not memorizing. You just keep that thing right down, and that thing's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and he's making sure he's hitting that shield every time. And then when life really does happen, you think you're going to battle with this massive because you block every dart. And it's this itty bitty little shield. And he's like, oh, baby, <laughs> this is going to be so easy. Do you see what he does? So if you haven't done anything for God, remember, what was our verse this past, this, this past month? First Peter 4.10. Each one should use whatever gift you have to serve others. Listen to me. I just need you to hear me. If you're not serving the church, if you're not serving Christ, you got a really small shield, really small weapons, and he's just waiting for the proper <laughs> time. Excuse me. Are you alive? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I don't know if we ever could possibly move on from this subject matter. It, you could be here for the rest of your life yeah. pondering, but I think the point of it all is to be sure that you're <clears throat> sure you stay in the Word. You walk in the truth. You walk in a relationship, you let him correct you, he's never wrong. Yeah, that's right. So if this church, Sardis, hits you between the eyeballs, uh, there's a purpose for that. Yeah. And I told you I went to the doctor last week to give blood because he wanted to run <coughs> some numbers. <laughs> Excuse me. He said, you look like a runner, all that. And he goes, it looks like the running and exercise and diet has paid off for you. All of your numbers match 
what your body presents. And I was like, oh, thank God. No glove, no doctor. <laughs> thank you, Lord. All of the numbers matched. Do you understand what a compliment that is? That the exterior matches what the interior is. The unseen is matching the visible. He says, we're good. Your numbers project health. Can the Lord Jesus say the same if he does a CAT scan, takes some blood? You appear to be alive. You appear to be functioning. I think I saw your hands up in church during worship. I think I saw you memorize 1, John 4, or 1 Peter 4.10. I think I see you. But let's take a CAT scan to see if it matches. Let's see if the outside matches the inside. If it doesn't, he says, we're going to have to do some more tests. And by that, he means more tests. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. and it's, But they're going to find out what it is. Are you still all right with this journey with Christ? He loves you enough to tell you what's wrong. And that's what I love about doctor's offices because there's nearly no stake in the game for them to lie to you. They gain their paycheck by telling you the truth about what the tests are and what's going on with you. So same with us. If we offend you or hurt your feelings about what we read and study, it's not because we hate you. It's because we love you. And we want you to rally around what we've studied. And if we're seeing it from a different angle, which we've shown you know the whole cup perspective, right now with this cup, it's white and there's no writing on it. And if I explained it to you, look, I'm looking at this cup and there's no writing on it. All of you would say, uh, excuse me, you're wrong. <laughs> from our perspective, there's writing on that cup. And I would need you to tell me what's over here because I can't see it. And until I can join you in that perspective, I won't ever see it, will I? That's why we need each other. Because if we can get a 360 view of this cup and walk and journey, I can trust you that you see stuff that I can't see. And I'll believe you because I, I see you looking at the cup. And I think that's what the journey with Christ is all about in terms of discipleship and relationship and church. That's why all of these things are necessary because none of us are brilliant enough to see this cup 360, right? We need each other. I believe we need Arminianism and I believe we need Calvinism. I believe we need other theologians to step up and say, maybe there's another point that the two other gentlemen haven't even seen yet. And if we can get there together and see it from scripture and do the right dividing of the word of God, I think we're all better for it. Amen.